Okay, semantic highlighting in TLA+. Plus. In retrospect, this is actually not that good of a uh, title for the talk, but at the time I submitted it, I thought that it was the main thing I was doing. Turns out we can do more, which uh, makes this talk more exciting. Uh, in fact, the thing I made, which is a tree seeder grammar for TLA+, plus, can be used as the basis for quite a bit uh, of tooling that might be able to make uh, TLA+, plus development a bit better. There is a web demo up there. I also linked it in the uh, Slack chat, and there's the repo right there, uh, my contact info, et cetera. Okay, this is just to kind of plant some seeds in your imagination, uh, which is what would you do if you could have access to the TLA parse tree in real time as the user was typing, even if there were parse errors, you can get like a pretty good tree. Uh, imagine that you were writing a program that like sat somewhere in the editor in some extension and you had full access to the parse tree, you could query, you could do all this stuff. Like, think about what kind of tools you could create. Just, I, I, this is just to like plant a seed. I'm not gonna quiz you or anything right off the bat here. But, so we have an example here. Uh, this is some TLA plus code on the left and on the right is the parse tree. You can, I'm not gonna like look at it too closely. You can just kind of see the loose correspondence. You have like some con constant declarations operator definition, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so let's talk about tree sitter. What is tree sitter? Tree sitter is a parser generator. If you've never tried to write a parser before by hand, it's horrible. There's a lot of really finicky like string processing code. You have to like, you know, write, keep track of a whole bunch of like keywords. It's horrible. So to solve this problem, uh, oh, by the way, all this, a lot of the code that you write is very boilerplate code. So to solve this problem, uh, people created the concept of parser generators where you use a DSL that kind of looks like the formal grammars that you learn about in university. And it takes that grammar and turns it into a parser. Uh, like it generates all these, this gnarly C code that is basically unreadable. And that, that's good enough to get you like 95% of the way there. And then usually the last 5% or so of the language you will like handwrite the parsing code. And it, it works pretty well. So TreeSitter is a parser generator. Uh, it has a few really interesting properties, which is that there's a focus on error recovery. So you know, if you, when you're like parsing, when, sorry, when you're typing a spec file, as you're typing, it's not always parsable, right? Like Sani or whatever wouldn't be able to parse it. Uh, so you have to be able to parse most of the file kind of like skip over the weird part and then like recover and re continue parsing the rest of the file. So there was a big uh, focus on that for TreeSitter's use case, which is language tooling, especially highlighting. Um, there want, there's, there's fast incremental parsing. So instead of having to reparse the entire file every time there's an edit, you can actually just reparse the edited section. This makes it very fast. You can actually parse on every single keystroke. Uh, there's a query API. You can make really neat queries of the, uh, the whole tree structure. And it's a nice little standalone library. Uh, it's just a, some generated C++ code. It's like very, basically no runtime requirements. Like you don't need the Java um, VM or anything like that. Uh, you, you can even like compile it with emscripted into WebAssembly, which is what the web demo is. It's just running there in the browser. And there's bindings also for this library in many languages, which is really nice. Like if you wanna write some uh, TLA plus extension in Rust or something, you can do that. And this is a really interesting thing which we'll get into later. There's a standardized API for tree sitter grammars and now a lot of people have written tree sitter grammars for various languages. So people have started writing tools that accept tree sitter grammars and do really interesting things. Uh, and we'll talk about those in a bit. And we're gonna talk also about the difference between tree sitter grammars and language servers. People always ask about this, like what's the difference between a language server and a tree sitter grammar? A language server, if you don't know, it was designed to solve the problem that if you have a programming language and you want to write an extension for it, for an editor, uh, it used to be the case that you had to write a different extension for every single editor out there, which is very annoying. So pretty recently, uh, I think Microsoft came up with a standard called the language server protocol, which is just a standardized API uh, that has things like get reference, go to definition, et cetera. And basically if you write a program that implements that API, there are a lot of different editors that can just talk to that language server and then right out of the box, you get pretty good language support in that editor. And yeah, you can write an LSP in any language, any framework, like a lot of the time, like say the language server for Rust will be written in Rust. The language server for R will be written in R. I have no idea how they did that, but they did. Uh, 
Yeah, and you know, it's, it's as built in support in like a lot of platforms already. Okay, so compare this with tree sitter grammars. Uh, the API for tree sitter grammars is a lot lower level. It's basically just parse, update, and query the tree, which is like get nodes that match this query. And also, you can like traverse the tree if you really want to do that. Uh, it's generated C code. So, like I said before, there's not really any runtime dependencies um, versus like it, with language servers, you really have to have like the runtime dependency of whatever the language server's for or is written in. It's supported by fewer platforms so far. Basically, just NeoVim, which is a. Ne you like NeoVim? Okay, that's good. We have some NeoVim fans. That's great. NeoVim, for those who don't know, it's a fork of Vim where you can write uh, plugins in Lua, which is really nice instead of VimScript. And it includes support for uh, language servers and tree sitter grammars right out of the box, which is interesting. So NeoVim and also GitHub, because this whole thing is actually developed by GitHub, tree sitter is. And I think they use it for highlighting and stuff. And then, as I said before, uh, people have built some interesting apps that consume tree sitter grammars. Okay. So I've given you some time to think over possible things you could do if you had access to the TLFS parse tree. Here's some ideas. Uh, there's semantic highlighting, and actually our very own Hillel Wayne wrote a blog post about this called Syntax Highlighting is a Waste of an Information Channel. Uh, the idea is, a lot of the, I mean, I'm, I'll, I'm actually really sorry to disappoint him because the, the syntax highlighting I've implemented is basically the sort of thing he says is a waste of an information channel, but whatever. It can, it can get better. Um, there's code folding, you know, like you want to be able to like collapse proofs, collapse comments, things of that nature. Uh, you know, symbol and reference finding. It's pretty easy with tree queries to be like, give me all the constants defined in this file, uh, and then is, do any of them match this like symbol that I'm sitting on? Also, this is an interesting idea, which I actually just kind of developed like two weeks ago. You can actually use this for uh, code analysis and like linting and stuff like that. Say you want to enforce like stylistic rules. It's pretty easy to do with tree sitter. You could like query for uh, a certain thing. Like maybe you want to check that uh, all operators that just have a top level conjunction list. It's like they're indented in a certain way. You can do that really easily. And this is a really, the final thing is, is really cool. I had no idea there would be accessibility applications when I started this. But actually, you, there's a project out there which takes tree sitter grammars and it, re it really improves the ability to code and navigate code via dictation. So I actually know two people in my larger professional slash friend group um, that have lost the ability to type, and they're both very gifted programmers. And so these dictation tools, they're, they're really valuable. And it turns out that one of them, which is called uh, cursorless, uh, takes tree sitter grammars. So you can say things like go to next code block or whatever, which is something that you'd only be able to do if, say, you had access to the parse tree. And we'll, we'll just take a quick look at that right now. Yeah, this is the GitHub repo. And you know, so this is like saying, like, this is what he's saying, and that's what's happening, basically. It, it, it's kind of indecipherable what's going on. But the basic idea is that, as you might get, get from the name, cursorless, the concept of a cursor is kind of moved beyond. So you operate at the level of like uh, code structure and like telling the computer what to do, rather than like following a little cursor around. It's, it's pretty neat. And uh, adding support for TLA plus to this would be really easy now that we have a grammar. OK. OK, so let's talk about highlighting. Uh, so conventional syntax highlighting, it just uses regular expressions, right? You write a re regular expression that matches this, and you say, uh, this is a comment, and then so on and so forth. So tree sitter enables exposing semantic information in highlighting, which is just not possible when you're trying to parse a non-regular language with regular expressions. For example, the uh, set membership operator, like in the expression x element of the natural numbers, it can be highlighted differently from the one in the construct for all x and nat such that blah, 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 which is kind of more of a keyword than an infix operator. It's sort of arguable whether this is syntactic or semantic, but that is always a hazy distinction. Uh, you know, identifiers to be highlighted based on what sort of thing they refer to. I think that's really valuable. Um, this is one thing that's cool, which I never got around to implementing, is conjunction disjunction lists can be given rainbow highlighting. I don't know if you've ever seen rainbow highlighting with like parentheses to, yeah. So kind of same thing with conjunction disjunction lists. Like um, a nested one could be a different color than the other one. Um, also, there's a there's a kind of like a, I guess you'd say an, a way of defining null in TLA plus that we're probably most of us are familiar with, 
where you say choose some element such that it's not in a set. Uh, and TLC recognizes this and treats it specially. We could highlight that specially. Uh, we could say like, oh, this is a, a null value or whatever. And all of this is powered by tree queries. There's not a lot of complicated stuff you have to do in order to do this, uh, which I'll show you in a couple slides. But first of all, let's just talk about how, hi how highlighting works at a high level. You have the code file. It's given to TreeSitter, and TreeSitter emits just a list of things like that. That says on, like line, on line one from byte 10 to 13, that's a constant. Or on line four from byte zero to six, that's an operator. And this big list of things is passed off to your color scheme. And it's usually it's just your default color scheme of your editor, but you can actually choose whatever one you want. Uh, and then finally, that ends up with the actual code being highlighted in a certain way. So that's kind of how highlighting works in the modern world. Um, and this is what a tree query looks like. So if we have our syntax tree, which we saw on like the second slide, if we wanted to highlight the name of, or we wanted to get a query that returns the node, uh, that is the name of an operator, on the right-hand side here, this operator definition, name identifier, and then this is this uh, at sign is a capture. So it captures uh, the identifier in this operator name, and, and that would refer to uh, the highlighted thing. So we're going to go over that uh, in a bit more depth. But this is the basic way that it works. Uh, you can have a basic node match where you just put the name of the node, and then you have the capture name. Uh, you can match nodes that only have children of a certain type. There's all sorts of extra stuff like negation, quantification, wildcards, predicates. It's like, a, it's like a whole query system. It really is. Uh, and you can look at the documentation there. It's also easy to define um, highlighting that is just based on captures. And I'm going to show you that right now. So in NeoVim, uh, I've defined the highlighting right now. And it, it, it looks like this. So I just say variable decoration. I say it's at variable. And there's a standard set of names that most color schemes will map to colors. Like variable is one, constant's another, like function.macro is. So I just define all these tree queries and assign names to them, and then boom, you just magically get syntax highlighting. That works really well. Um, they can get like somewhat complicated. And anyway, um, I'm also going to, I think this is when I wanted to do this demo. Let me make sure. Uh, yep, yeah, okay. So yeah, this is the WebAssembly uh, demo. And say we have, if, if, if you haven't gone here, um, this is what it'll look like, although I put some default, like I think it was like uh, reels or calculus or something spec there. But yeah, you have your spec on the left and the parse tree on the right. And if you click this query box, it actually opens this up and you can type in queries in real time. So say we want to uh, just match all the nodes. It would be like, uh, I guess that, wait, is it constant? Uh, constant, oh, declaration, there we go. You have to remember the names. OK. Uh, and then it would be identifier, and then you would say that it's like, um, I don't know, what, what, what do we call it? Like just that. So see that it's kind of like highlighted this. It's pretty easy. Uh, so let's, let's do a test. Say we, we wanted to find, um, like, I guess like no node is uh, choose n such that n not in node, right? This is a pretty common thing. If you've written a TLA plus spec, you've probably written something like this. How would we write a query that highlights this? Uh, we we want to highlight this thing right here. So uh, you would do it by going operator definition. Um, and then it's kind of, can I move this over? I don't think I can. That's a bit annoying. Oh, well. This is on a larger font than it was when I practiced this at home. OK. Uh, so choose. OK. And then, OK. So currently, um, this will map any, oh, sorry, this will match, this query will match any operators that have a choose thing. And uh, a choose construct is the top level thing. But of course, I mean, if we have some other one that's just like, 
um, and net, oops. Oh, I'm on caps lock. It's greater than zero, which is like all natural numbers, okay. Um, both of those will be highlighted, and that's not what we want. We want the, specifically the null one. So we have to get even more uh, precise here. Um, and we want to match it where it's identifier, and then an infix op, infix operator, which is like not in. So we, uh, we want to match all of them that have um, just an n here and then n not in something. Like, that's what we want. And so the way we write that is not in. And this should, yeah, so now we only match uh, null nodes. So you can imagine, yeah, we can like pick this out, like highlight it a specific color, which I think would be pretty cool. Um, and I hope you have a basic idea of how tree queries work, how easy they are, how easy they are to prototype. Okay, back to the actual presentation. Okay, uh, so you have this grammar, it's pretty cool. How do you actually consume it? There are official bindings, by official I mean developed by GitHub itself. Uh, they're available for Python, TypeScript, or JavaScript, Rust, and also just C, C++, because it's a C, C++ library. There are also many other unofficial bindings. Um, I've released this specific grammar as an NPM module, a Rust crate, or you can just download it from GitHub. And we're going to, I, I've also created this repository here, uh, TLA plus tool dev examples, which has just very simple examples of how you can quickly get started uh, consuming this grammar. And I will show you that right now. Uh, so for example, if we want to look at the TypeScript one, um, you would just add a dependency in package.json to the treesitter tree TLA plus package, and then it's as simple as this. You set up the parser, you have your source code, and then you say parser.parse, and then you get this tree, and you can do queries against it. So this is how easy it is to just parse TLA plus and do queries against it now. Uh, so if you're a developer, you're interested in writing TLA plus tooling, I think this is probably a, a cool place to start for you. All uh, right. Okay, you're like, well, you know, I'm not really, I don't really want to write TLA plus dev tooling, but how can I actually use this today? Uh, and right now, the only actual application which I've gone to the trouble of making is in NeoVim. Uh, if you install NeoVim and you install the NVim TreeSitter plugin to enable its support for TreeSitter, and then you install TLA plus, which all you need to go do is go install, uh, TS install TLA plus, and then you open any .tla file in NeoVim, then it's, uh, then it'll be nice and highlighted, which is, which is pretty cool. Um, and before I show you a demo of that, I'm also gonna talk to you about Unicode TLA+. If you've paid attention to the Google group at all lately, I started a topic on this. I don't know if anyone's read that. But it is 2020 and, sorry, it's not 2020. It's 2021. Uh, UTF-8 is supported basically everywhere, and so we can enjoy any, like, things beyond 128 English language characters. For example, all of the math Unicode characters. You know, we, we spend all day writing these specs just like staring at the, uh, the LaTeX symbol identifiers or whatever without actually seeing the beautiful symbols themselves, unless you go to the trouble of producing the pretty printed spec, but like you can't edit that spec, et cetera. So I think it'd be pretty cool if we had Unicode symbols in TLA+. Um, but there's some drawbacks to that. One is that you actually have to care about what font you use. Um, most fonts, mo all monospace fonts basically look good displaying all the 128 ASCII characters, but a lot of them pay a lot less care to how they display uh, the Unicode characters. And especially um, you want one that displays them in monospace because a lot of fonts don't actually display Unicode characters in monospace, which matters in TLA plus because uh, vertical alignment of conjunction lists matters a lot. Um, also, it just needs to look good because that's why we're doing this in the first place, because we want it to look good. Uh, also, SANI and TLC don't support it. I should say Ron Pressler has done some work here. It was, he got some stuff merged into like a beta release, but it had some random errors or something like that, and it ended up, didn't end up making it into the full release. Uh, this was about four years ago. Also, it's a bit tricky to convert between ASCII and Unicode TLA plus specs because of the alignment of conjunction lists has to be maintained. 
um, and it changes because, for example, like the, the and character is two ASCII characters, but if you like shrink it into one uh, Unicode character, like that changes the vertical alignment. You, you have to like be really careful, basically. But um, I've created this, this, I don't know, it's like the TLA plus standard, whatever. Um, <laughs> I, I don't even think anyone like, has like, started this repo, so I don't know how via, like, valid it is as like, the standard, but whatever. Uh, I've created a proposal of TLA plus um, language translations, and so it's just a table, and it has like, like in map, a lot of them are pretty brain dead, like in maps to set membership, stuff like that. Um, the arrows, there are like a million different arrows in Unicode, so it's kind of more of a design problem, what you choose. Um, but yeah, no, have a look at that. Uh, I've, I, I have a readme that says why I chose what I chose, and if you have ideas, that should be changed. It's still very fluid. Uh, I've also wrote, written a NeoVim plugin using Vim's abbreviations, which lets you very easily uh, write in Unicode as, as you type, basically. So you like type something and it'll like translate it into Unicode immediately. And I've written my tree sitter grammar so that it parses the Unicode symbols as if they were their ASCII equivalents. And we will see a demo of that right now. Okay, so we have this. Um, you know, see, like, translates it pretty easily. Maybe we want, like, a conjunction list. Okay. And then, ooh, a nested one. Um, also, here's a cool thing. So you see how uh, that and, wait, oh, hold, hold on. Yeah, so that and sign is um, highlighted differently from the other and signs. To indicate that the red and sign, it, it, it's interpreted as an infix operator versus the other ones are interpreted as um, the conjunction list. So that's actually pretty useful because uh, you don't have any real visibility into like what's interpreted as what for conjunction list versus not um, usually when you're writing. Uh, what's some other stuff we can do? I don't know, we got comments. Um, yeah, I, I can. I set up like code code folding for comments, so we can like fold it, which is pretty cool. Um, what else? I don't know. Someone someone yell out something to type. Oh, and. Oh, and? In. In. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So uh, let's do like um, uh, maybe we'll have like node. Uh, like that or something, you know. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so this is available right now. Uh, is a Vim plugin. Uh, if you know how to install Vim plugins by using, there's like a lot of different plugin managers out there. It works with probably all of them because it's extremely simple. It literally just in, like adds a bunch of abbreviations anytime you open a TLA file. Um, okay, back to the main presentation. Uh, oh, it's all right. I, oh, oh, there's one thing I wanted to show you before we go. Um, fo folding. Uh, folds are also really uh, easy to do. Wow, this is, this is not, okay, fine. Um, so you usually want folding anytime you have proofs because the nice thing about hierarchical proofs is you can like hide and expand uh, subproofs, uh, so we can do that because I went to the trouble, which let me assure you was very harrowing of properly parsing proofs and levels. Uh, and now because of that, you can collapse proofs. So this, this took me like an entire month of my life. That, look at that. <laughs> look at that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think that mostly concludes the demos, but anyway. So in the process of writing a TLA plus parser, I ran into all sorts of fun nooks and crannies uh, of the language, which I'd like to share with you. One is that, somewhat hilariously, uh, the block comment star token is itself a valid character in the language. Um, if you were to pass the multiplication operator as a higher level operator, or a parameter, or sorry, is a, a parameter to uh, some other function, I mean, that's valid TLA plus, but it also trigger like the block comment start. The way around that is really easy. You just put spaces on the other side of the multiplication operator, but I thought it was kind of funny. Anyway, also, and then you can find, define values in uh, binary, octal, or hex. Who knew? 
Um, you can also use recursive operators inside let in constructs. Uh, I learned that a lot about let in constructs, actually. Yeah, I learned that you can use them like basically anywhere. Like um, anywhere that you would have an expression, you can put a let in construct. I thought it was only like a top level thing right below operator, but no, you, you can put them like absolutely anywhere. Uh, this is a really neat, cool thing that um, I thought only Rust had this, but you can like destructure tuples. So in instead of having to like get a tuple and then like index into it, you can. Um, have the values of the tuple like assigned to actual variables and then use them in the function. I thought that was neat. There's, uh, this is a, a very interesting ambiguity that we haven't yet really figured out how to handle. It's just, you just hope not to run into it, which is that the infix operator, the O plus infix operator, uh, introduces weird ambiguity. For example, like what does F O plus G mean? Is it just F O plus G or is it like, passing the plus operator is a higher order parameter to some function f, like f of plus, basically. And you can see like, well, you just look if g is after it, and you have to be, remember that, you know, okay, it can't just be g, like what if g is like the start of a ne another unit definition, like g equals equals something. So you have to look, start looking like way ahead in the code to figure out like what is after it, and uh, at this point, it's just like always parsed as like f o plus g, I'm pretty sure, so, and work around it by putting spaces around the plus. Um, there's this ability to refer to sub-expressions of large expressions, which I won't tell you about here, because Leslie views it as like a huge mistake that this was ever added to the language. Uh, and you can only ever find it in like the TLA plus two language specification. Um, nobody ever really uses it, so it's whatever. But I, I think it's neat, because uh, like, yeah. And this is the final one, this is kind of my favorite, because this broke parsing for a while, and I looked at it, and I was like, there's no way that you can do that. But yeah, you can write less than or equal to is equals less than. That, uh, and this, this actually kind of has a, has a vision of like an alternate reality, I guess, where the less than or equal to is not actually less than or equal to, it's like material implication going from right to left, and like the equal less than is like the canonical way of writing less than or equal to, I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah? That's what prologue does. Yeah. Oh. That makes sense. Yeah, okay, so, you know. These are, these are like the fun things I learned um, as I was parsing TLA plus. And I also just like want to share my experience of writing a TLA plus parser. Uh, conjunction and destruction lists are really difficult to parse because you have to keep track of like your current state uh, or your current like column and, and stuff like that. And there's all these rules about when to end conjunction distribution list, when to start a new one, uh, when it transitions into being an infix operator. Uh, proofs, also very difficult to parse. I have this like wild state diagram I made of all the different ways that like a proof can be started and how that changes its level. Um, case constructs, also very difficult to parse. They have dangling else ambiguity because uh, they're not really ever terminated by anything. Like they don't need to have an other so it can just kind of just end. And it's really hard to figure out uh, how that interacts with like conjunction disjunction lists. Um, and yeah, I started out thinking TLA plus was like a small language. Like I was like, ah, we'll knock this out in like two months. And it took six months, so you know. Uh, it's actually, it, it is pretty, pretty complicated language even though it seems kind of small. Um, the reason that proofs and conjunction disjunction lists are difficult to parse is because they are what you call context sensitive. Uh, their meaning depends on like what's around them. It, like if you just look at a single conjunction, conjunct, um, whether it's part of like that group that came previously, it depends on like what the column those are in, stuff like that. It's the same thing with proofs. Uh, so when I talked about the 95% that is taken care of by the parser generator, this is part of the 5% basically. So the first 95% I'd say probably took like three months and then like the other 5% took the rest of the three months. Um, Okay, well, you're like, this seems pretty cool. How can you contribute? Actually, one thing that helped a lot was the TLA plus examples repo. Because when, when you're writing a parser, just having a corpus of specs to test your parser against is really, really helpful. Like, it's the sort of thing that you don't care about until you're like, man, I really wish I had something to parse right now. So actually, during my continuous inter uh, integration process of the, of the repo, it like downloads the examples repo and like runs the parser against every file in the repo. So if you have any, TLA plus files just like hanging around. You're, they're just sitting in some GitHub repo. You're like, oh, they're not good enough to put in the examples repo. Yes, they are. Put them in there. I would, I would love to have them. Um, and also, yeah, if, you, if you're into like building actual development tools, uh, you can use the grammar. You can file bugs, feature requests, all that stuff. I mean, how this 
this really becomes like a, a really solid project is with people using it and running, in, running into all the things that I wasn't able to find through testing and other such things. Okay, so uh, possible future work. This, this whole thing was self-funded. I'm, I'm an independent contractor who doesn't have any contracts, which is a fancy way of signing up unemployed. Uh, <laughs> It's, it's really great, actually. Like, nobody's ever like, oh, do you have any contracts? And they're like, no. And, you know, you, you can get away without being unemployed. Um, anyway, yeah. So I, this was basically a sabbatical project. Um, it was all self-funded. My savings are being dwindling down, et cetera. Um, so I'm going to go back to like regular contracting soon so I can like, save some money and hopefully work some more on this stuff because this is what I want to do. I want to work on TLA Plus stuff. It's really fun. I like it a lot. I'm sure that many of us here share that sort of dream. Um, but if anyone around here happens to work for a large company that uses TLA+, sadly the MongoDB people walked out uh, right before my talk, but it's okay. Uh, and like maybe they, they want to like pay someone to do these things, I promise you my rates are like quite low for this type of work, basically just covering my living expenses. Uh, and so I've scoped out three possible projects that you could get, I think, with a pretty high degree of certainty based on uh, my success with this project. One is that I could uh, add Pluscal support as a tree sitter grammar. So currently the, uh, the grammar does not support Pluscal. I would say I could probably do this in about one to two months because of how much overlap there is with TLA+. Uh, and tree sitter really interestingly can handle multiple languages in a single file, which is really nice because you could have, you have Pluscal in the same file as TLA+. Uh, for a four to six month project, uh, building a language server with this grammar as the back end, I think, would be a, a pretty good project. You know, you get like bring, you could bring standardized uh, functionality to many platforms, like just something simpler, like simple, like go to definition or like find all references, things of that nature. And this is the big, the big kahuna. Um, just gonna, just gonna throw this out there. Uh, writing a full alternative TLA plus parser and interpreter. Um, I, I, I think I can do this in a year. And people are like, oh, you just, you want to be, you just want to rewrite, you just want to rewrite it in Rust or whatever. Um, <laughs> true, but also, uh, it, a lot has been written about how, you know, like, rewriting in the context of business and stuff is bad. And, like, all engineers want to rewrite everything because of technical debt, yada, yada, yada. They weren't the ones who wrote it, whatever. And that, so, you know, um, usually in the business world, you don't actually want to do rewrites. However, Within languages, uh, programming languages, it's actually really healthy to have multiple implementations. And this is so that the, lang the implementation does not become the standard. This has already actually started to happen with TLA+. Uh, the TLA+, standard documents no longer match what SANI actually does. And SANI actually kind of takes precedence over them. So I've, I've kind of like done some work to update the standard documents in that, in that way. But uh, it, it would be really nice to have um, yeah, like an alternative parser. Uh, like I think, it, it, this is the, first of all, the only, we could only, I, I could only like even pitch this if we had Sandy around, cause like it's just like really bulletproof and it'll continue to work now and far into the future. Um, and building something more maybe experimental, fast moving, whatever, probably outside of the Java ecosystem, et cetera. Um, that, anyway, that's a possibility. So anyone out there who has like some cash to burn, I also, Take cryptocurrency if that's your thing. If you're into that, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's it. Anyone have any questions? Yeah, thanks, Andrew. So, what are your living expenses? Uh, I don't want to really get into this because, like, you know, this is an international thing, and like, living expenses here are, like make me look like the most decadent person in the entire world. I will say it's, uh, I, would, I would probably be asking for about like, probably less than half the money I would make if I were to work as like a full-time W2 employee. I don't know if that like puts a, a rough number on it. But I, I'm, a, I'm a fairly frugal person as far as software engineers go. Yeah. So I've got the um, tree sitter grammar installed in NeoVim. How do I activate the Unicode? So are you, you got the... You got the what? The I've got the tree sitter installed already. How do I activate the Unicode extension? Uh, if you, did you download and install the yeah, Unicode? Yeah, it's, it's on. I'm, I'm, I'm using the syntax highlighting right now for. Um, oh, you are? Okay, cool. Yeah. So if you install the plugin, um, then you should be able to open a .tla file. And then as soon as you like type ASCII and then press enter or space, it'll like translate. If it doesn't do that, then that's a bug. 
I think I might just not have it enabled is the thing. Like, don't you have to like enable the capability? I'll ask you afterwards. This is not okay, that Okay, I'll, I'll see. I'll, I'll check on that. All right. Not a good sign that the demo just didn't work. Everybody right. else needs tech support here. You mentioned that you had seen differences between the, um, the standard and Sani's implementation. Um, I, I believe there's also a TLA grammar in TLA. Um, and I was wondering if you had seen any differences there as well. Yeah, that's what I meant by the standard. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. So I, I've, I've, I've filed some PRs uh, against that standard. They're actually living in the TLA standard repo I made that nobody looks at. Um, but I, I sent them over to Leslie, because there's like two swaths of changes I made for him to choose from, basically. Uh, you can look at the open PRs to see like the basic changes. But yeah. By the way, technically, uh, to point out, TLabs, the proof system, is also its own parser, right? It has an OCaml TLA plus parser. So there are quite a few parsers out there. Um, more question? I know there are a few questions on the chat. Uh, there are. Um, first thing, if you want to rewrite TLA plus in Rust, please talk to me. Um, <laughs> It, w it wouldn't be. That, that was a joke. That was a joke. I wouldn't do that in Rust. I wouldn't. No. If anyone wants to do that, please talk to me. Okay. <laughs> oh, they said they would. They want to do. It. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, totally. I would do. I would do that. All right. Yeah. Cool. Um, to the questions. Uh, number one: For areas of the source file where syntax errors are present, what does this parsing approach create as representation about syntactic information that might be in these areas? Uh, it's a good question. I can actually show you. So. I guess if you point the camera back up there, um, if we, uh, so, oh, by the way, I, I should say, this, this grammar I've made is not really suitable is for use as like a, a top level frontline parser interpreter because, because of this, because it doesn't actually have good error messages. There's no capacity for saying error messages. Uh, but say we say like op, um, I don't know, someone give me a syntax error, like one, two. It'll, it'll see, it'll see like, uh, it, it'll try to come up with like a plausible parse, basically, and it won't really be correct. It'll usually be good enough for highlighting. Uh, but the correctness criterion of this parser, by the way, is that if you type in valid TLA plus, then you will get a valid, like the right syntax tree. That's the correctness criterion I made. So if you find something that doesn't satisfy that, then that's a bug. Um, but yeah, usually uh, it, it's quite good at isolating the bad parts of the TLA plus syntax tree from the, the good parts, especially if you're like editing a file over time and it was like in a parsable state, then it'll like really weight the fact that those nodes were at one time in a parsable state to like avoid like vacuuming them into the error, I guess you could say. Uh, I don't know if I made sense at all. But yeah, like, so it'll just say like, oh, there's an error here. Sometimes if you're lucky, it'll say like missing a, um, a, like a parentheses or something like that, yeah. Cool. Um, next question. When mapping TLA plus operators to Unicode symbols, were there any cases where multiple Unicode characters were possible choices? And if so, what approach was used to decide which symbol to choose? Uh, there were. Yeah, there were actually multiple cases. If you look at the standards repo, I document these cases in the README, uh, like the symbol translation decisions section. It'll have, uh, there's like, you know, like seven or eight or whatever. Yeah. Um, it was basically just aesthetic preference. So a lot of these are open for debate. They aren't like set in stone. Uh, I, mean, I welcome people's suggestions um, about like what, what the correct ones should be, or even if there should be like a single correct one. Like maybe we should, the parser should accept multiple because there are definitely cases like, let's look at a simple one. Um, oh, this is one I really like. So if and only if uh, and equivalent refer to the same operator, which is usually printed as a sort of like hamburger thing. Um, but I, 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 managed, I decided to split them up into like the actual like double-sided arrow and then equiv gets you the hamburger operator. But anyway, all oh, right. Uh, for example, angle bracket. There's this angle bracket and then there's like an angle bracket with a space? I don't know. <laughs> um, so I chose the one without a space. Uh, yeah. I think that's how you quote things in certain languages is the, the right one. I would believe that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's weird. Um, uh, next question. Can the parser handle exceptionally long inputs? Uh, for example, during the work on extreme modeling paper, the authors at Mongo encountered TLA plus records of 60K plus lines of code when trace checking. 
Like, sorry, is the question whether it can handle like really large files? Uh, exceptionally long input, so yes, I think. Uh, Let me just quickly rephrase the yeah. question. So let's say you have a huge, humongous record of records of records of functions up to 60,000 and more lines of code. Right. It, it, it should be able to handle it. It depends on how much memory your computer has because a rule of thumb is that I, oh God, the, the memory, the, since it's keeping this giant tree around basically, it's, uh, it uses quite a bit of memory. So it, it really depends how much memory your system has. But like, in terms of the actual speed of the parser, it should be able to handle it. Because uh, it's, it's, it's called an LR1 parser, which means that it basically just reads from left to right without like a lot of looking forward and backward, except for when it's parsing like conjunction and disjunction lists. So it probably could handle it. I've never tried, though. It, it would be interesting to try. Uh, this question is relevant to something you mentioned about uh, having multiple implementations. Mm. Um, I know. Uh, how can we guarantee interoperability between the various parsers? Is someone going to create a parser test suite to make sure that TLA plus users don't run into subtle differences in parsers? Uh, so I can tell you right off the bat that they function differently because uh, there are a couple of bugs in SANI and uh, there, those, a couple of those bugs have been fixed in my parser. Um, and I really would like to get a, like a, a fuzzing suite together, which is kind of why I like the examples repo. Um, yeah, if I were to actually go the route of writing the full-on alternative parser, I would definitely be like fuzzing it against uh, both this parser and uh, SANI to find differences. Uh, which is what the importance of a standard, by the way. It's why we need to have like a standard that's independent of any given implementation. Yeah, isn't the sort of as an extension to this question the the syntax, the parsers being different is part one of that. But if there are subtle differences in semantics because of those parsing things, then you run into uh, what is TLA plus. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, so that's that's why we need to have um, an independent just standard that says like what it is in all cases. Like this is what every programming language goes through. Uh, there are people who who dedicate their entire lives to figuring out what like the meaning of a walrus operator is, and then someone gets like politically ejected from their whole career. And you know, anyway, this is Python. Um, so yeah, it, it, there just needs to be a standard, and it needs to be I don't know, presumably like some kind of not even democratic, but like communal way of deciding what uh, that standard is. And it, we, it already is like pretty well established. There's just like a couple of weird corner cases, I would say. Uh, may I interject here? Because yeah. there exists this TLA plus RFC repository on GitHub that's free for everybody to propose RFCs. Mm -hmm. um, so in that sense, we have this channel already. It's just a matter of people making use of it. Yeah. Oh, and I saw that you had a yeah, question there. Yeah. I just wanted to ask you, have you ever considered doing like a pretty printer for TLA plus where, you know, someone could hand you a TLA source file and maybe it's not indented correctly and you go through and do all the indentations correctly and, and stuff like that with your tool? Yeah, I mean, I never even thought about that until like a week or two ago when someone brought it up in the Unicode thread. Uh, and I was like, yeah, you could, you could use that. You could, you could use this for that. You really could. Um, so. I mean, I hope someone, I, in fact, I hope that someone does make it. Like, I'm, I'm not going to work on that, uh, but I hope someone does. Yeah. Cool. There's a couple more questions. Um, as we've seen in previous, talk, previous talks, TLA plus specs usually have a fraction of size compared to code. Uh, what return on investment do you expect for bringing sophisticated syntax highlighting and perhaps manipulation to TLA plus? Have you explored, well, yeah, have you explored syntax highlighting for pretty printed specs you kind of touched on? Uh, return on investment, I mean, I don't know. I just did this because it was fun. Um, this is like what I wanted to do, I guess. Uh, but you know, now that I'm like, oh, pay me to work on this stuff, I have to come up with an actual sales page. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that there are many, there are real ways that, not necessarily just syntax highlighting by itself, but um, all the associated advances in tooling that comes with developing 
more advanced syntax highlighting will improve the TLA plus editing experience. Uh, and yeah, I, I even, I really like my syntax highlighting that I've developed. I, I like uh, looking at TLA plus that's highlighted in that way. The one thing that I, I, is supposedly coming down the pipeline, this is like a NeoVim issue, is highlighting like say, like constants when you use them later in the file in like the same highlighting as like they were originally highlighted. Uh, I was really scrambling to try and get this working before this demo, but I couldn't quite get it working. So um, if you're interested, you can go to the NVIM tree sitter GitHub repo and look at a discussion where this is like the top, one of the top discussions about when this is gonna happen and whatever. Um, so anyway, yeah, I don't know if that really answered, it's kind of rambling. Okay, I guess we are through with uh, the conference then. Let's thank Andrew one more time. Thank you.